right away recording again so you want to grab a copy of that zip file you also want to ensure that you have your website up and running and please if you don't mind also have dvwa up and running as well as you can see i have my instance of debian running right here i'm also going to fire up putty your section one because um, at some point I'm going to need to modify a file to show you some of the threats that we're trying to mitigate against with our access control systems okay so have Debian up running I you don't need to have putty up and running as you know I use putty so you can follow along more easily with what I'm typing in we're obviously going to need to uh, your recording so you can't swear you're also going to need to ensure that you have win scp up and running as well because you're going to need to deploy some content to your some new content to your blog site and while here just a quick recommendation let's call this a milestone all right i'm not going to talk to you about um asset management in a real project where you're using some kind of a git repository for version control or other version controlling software but in a situation like this this is a key point you may want to do a milestone backup and it's really quite easy to do in WinSCP. select the directory the app whatever you want to right click and select duplicate it'll allow you to create a backup of that content today's the 24th of November and the defaults are usually fine and then you have a duplicate at that point of your content okay so just file that away for future reference this is um, when SCP the reason why I encourage students to use it is because it has a lot of nice little features like that very quick and easy way to do a directory backup this would for me considered to be a pretty milestone point so I would probably do a backup at this point also ensure that you have the um, stung eye blog software in place so that you can create a new user and it stores those credentials in your database properly this is my database in SQL manager um, usernames are there and they are salted and hashed passwords okay that's what uh, you should have in place before you start adding the access control information any questions and thank you whoever that was I think that was Scott thank you by the way I do appreciate it any other questions already let's move on nope access control um, we've already taken a look at some basic authentication that we created for our application authentication proves that you are who you say you are um, authorization basically says what you can do once you've proven you are who you say you are authorization or access control allows you to gain access to resources on a web application best example is you don't want regular users using the admin portal on a web application all right authentication is who you are authorization is what you can do um, access control is a process where requests to access specific resources are programmatically managed to either a grant or a deny and there's a couple of different schools of thought on this there are some schools that say configure for deny everything and then add access as necessary um, some people say you know just create so everybody can access the basic stuff and then the more complicated stuff you add layers of protection to them for example most web facing content on a website is probably public visible you're not going to start by blocking all of that content and then turning it off what you might do is some of the more um, focused content user specific content that's where you're going to add access control unfortunately there's no perfect answer it's either or and it really does depend on your specific implementation okay and this applies to regular apps and web apps as well 
there are different types of access controls. I got this um, information quite liberally, not only from Wikipedia and this article, um, which was a few years ago now. Uh, I haven't read the article in a while, but uh, it was a really good article on access control models. I thought it was pretty good. And then I augmented it with some of the stuff from OWASP. We've talked about OWASP. We've talked about OWASP in the past. And OWASP has a lot of really cool features. It's not just WebGoat and WebScarab, or not WebScarab, uh, WebGoat and Zap and um, WebWolf. Their whole point is developing a community to help users build secure websites. And they've got a lot of content, a lot of reports, a lot of documents, including some really good stuff on access control. The solution we are going to implement today on access control, it's called PHP RBAC, and it's from the OWASP website. There's different types of access control models. One is attribute-based, um, where you can give access through users, which um, evaluate attributes, um, all kinds of things. And based on that, users are given access to individual resources. The user has attributes, the resource has attributes, and there's kind of like a processing entity that puts the two together. Discretionary access control is where the owner determines who can access specific resources. Um, that's another example. We don't really see that a lot in web applications, and I got that one from the OWASP cheat sheet. History-based access control, we tend to see this as a delimiter more than an enabler. The best example of history-based access control is where you grant access, or more specifically, or more typically, I should say, you remove access based on somebody's actions. You would log somebody out after so many tries of a failed login. That would be an example of history-based access control, where it is blocking rather than allowing. Identity-based, which is where um, you can give access based on individual identities. As we've talked about time and time again, that's probably one of the um, less effective man manners. I'm not saying it doesn't have its place. As with most things in IT, there is rarely a single solution that will work in every single scenario. Um, even some of the more foundational things, um, like relational databases, don't always work the best in certain scenarios. So you can't ever speak with absolutes. So when I say generally you uh, create uh, groups to access resources, you give permissions to those groups, and then you assign users to those groups is considered the best way of managing resource access. It's not an absolute, and sometimes you need to do an individual one as well. You can also do organization-based access control. You can just design it outside of the security system. I've never actually seen an implementation of that. Mandatory access control, that's where you just give everybody access based on things that they really don't have any control over. Um, you often see top secret things like that in, in um, security, sorry, in privacy related content. What we want to focus on is what's called role based access control or RBAC. Um, basically, what you do is you create a type of permission that you want. You create a group um, that you give access to that permission and then you assign users to that group. Um, and these are roles. They, these permissions are roles. And it's much easier to manage this for web application. In some cases it might be a little too broad. It might be overkill. The example where it would be overkill is that you've got a web application where you've got regular users and a single admin account. It doesn't make sense to go through the entire overhead of a role-based application when all you really need is a single admin account and every page verifies that that user is an admin. However, once we implement PHP RBAC, you may see that even you know, a simple implementation like that might benefit from a simple tool like PHP RBAC. Okay, uh, we'll see. Okay, and then there's also rule-based access control, or RAC. Um, it's context-based. 
Um, a best example like this would be in the college's system where you only have access to certain labs at certain times of the day. If they um, limited the card swiping that you had for P305 or 306 to certain times of the day based on your schedule. Responsibility-based access control at the college, an example of that would be as an instructor, I automatically get access to blah. As students, you automatically get access to blah. And again, um, these solutions don't necessarily have to exist in silos. They can work together with other solutions. And permission-based access control is when you set a, set a bunch of permissions that we see in the Unix file system. You can also see the same thing in relational databases. Any questions? I know I'm not. Are there any questions? Okay, let's move on. Um, the reason why we have access control policies is to ensure that we don't have any mistakes in our environment. Um, so because we, um, when we did our encrypted passwords, when we first set up our login page for a Stungai blog, we set up a user ID and a password, and then we added encryption on top of it, and it kind of broke what we already had in place. The same thing can happen with an access policy as well. If you don't set up an access policy ahead of time properly, and you come in and you try and apply it after the fact, it might cause some problems. It might cause unnecessarily more complicated implementation than it really needs to be. As such, an access policy should be implemented early in the development cycle just like proper encryption for passwords should be done as early as possible in the development cycle as well. Okay. Um, what you need to do is verify. And that's kind of one of the reasons why we've been going through pen testing is that anytime you implement any of these security things on your website, yeah, you can do unit testing and then you can use, um, you can um, implement um, application testing at milestone points as well. But part of your testing has to include security testing as well. Um, in OWASP, they talk about four main testing categories, where, testing categories when it comes to security. Directory traversal, bypassing authorization, escalating your privileges, and then referencing objects that you shouldn't have access to. Let's take a look at these so we can understand them better. Are there any questions? Okay. Before we take a look at directory traversal, a couple of things need to be understood. First off, we're going to take a look at the OWAT, the correction, the DVWA. Where the hell am I? There it is. Christ. I'm recording myself. So, first things admin, password, log into your DVWA. Verify your DVWA security should be set to low. So your security level is set to low. And we're going to take a look at file inclusion. And as soon as we take a look at it, it says the allow URL encode is not enabled in your PHP config. So that's what we're going to take a look at first. So we need to make sure that DVWA is running. We need to understand directory separators as well. Most PHP sites, not all, but most PHP sites are running on Unix architectures, which means we use a forward slash for the directory separator. Windows, they're a backslash. Also, because of this error that we just saw, the allow URL include is not enabled. We're going to have to modify the PHP INI file. And around line 861, it's actually line 856 in my file. There's an allow URL include statement. So let's take a look at that. So you can use nano for this, but you're modifying a server config. So the first thing you want to do is set your permissions, sorry, set your credentials to root. Yeah, okay, good. And then CD Etsy or ETC, PHP, and then just tab. There's only one version of PHP installed in our environments, and it's 7.3, a tab, and then we're in the directory that has the PHP INI. The directory is ETC, PHP, 7.3, Apache 2. 
All right, tab really, really is your friend. And then we want to modify the PHP INI. You can use whatever text editor you prefer. If you're comfortable with Vi, go for it. But we want to use Nano. Before you invoke Nano, though, please do the dash L switch. This turns on line numbering, so we can make sure that we're on the right line. All right, so nano dash L as root, and then php dot ini. It opens up the ini file as root, and it should allow us to um, edit our file. Now, when you take a look at the nano interface, down here, it tells us that there is a command to go to a specific line. There's also a find option as well. So there's the control W, where is, and you can search again for that allow URL include, or you can simply go to a line. I'm going to do control, shift, and then the dash because I want the underscore. So control shift dash and it says give me a line number and I think I said it was 856 for me. But by having the lines on you can find it around line 856 or so. Okay and there it is right there. Allow URL encode. It is currently set to off. Comment that and then add a line below it where you say allow URL encode is equal to on, just like that, okay? If you're not using PuTTY, you can't copy and paste with your mouse, which is one of the reasons why we use PuTTY, is that it gives us a much nicer terminal interface into our servers. So again, how did I do this? I did the control shift dash so I could have control underscore so I could go to a specific line. Okay, I went to line 856. I commented out the old one. And I added a new one below it. You don't have to comment out the old one. This is the old school customs person in me. You never delete the old configuration. And actually what you should do is this. You should tell future systems people who did it and why okay that's the proper way of messing with system config settings all right so control o to save our work and control x to exit now that i've done that and as root i can restart apache 2. i've changed the configuration of php i have to reload that configuration in apache so service apache 2 uh, restart just like that and now when I go into my website it allows me to do the file inclusion vulnerability what does that look like well here it is right here and, I, and you might have to zoom in in teams to look at my address bar but I'm able to click on different files and it'll include it at that point problem is is that I can also go outside of the document root. It's like I'm saying page is equal to file one. Well, I can actually say page is equal to Etsy password. And it doesn't look good here, but when you take a look at the page source, that's the list of users. And that's a simple, simple, simple hack that you could do in a number of different ways. Okay. Which is why you rarely, if ever, you rarely, if ever, want to turn this on. Some people turn it on, though, because they need to access stuff outside of the document root. There are some schools of thought that say you should put your configuration files outside of your document root. You may need to allow that URL include on to allow that, but it opens up its own series of risks. So there's no perfect way of doing this. You just have to try and balance risks with features. Any questions on that? No, this isn't fine. Okay. 
So we were able to show exactly what tra directory traversal means. It's by simply allowing people to display stuff outside. Now I went outside of the document route. There's nothing stopping me from taking a look at some of the other content as well inside of the document route. That's not what I want. If I take a look at my DVWA and I take a look at vulnerabilities and what we're looking at is uh, what are we looking at? Phi file inclusions. All right, so I'm looking in this directory here, but there's nothing stopping me from looking at some of the other directories. Like I could take a look at the brute and the source or the brute and the help. Like I can navigate and look at other directories, which is why you want to ensure that you have these securities in place because if you allow people to load other directories, which is quite common, you need to ensure that any of the other ones have the appropriate access control mechanisms in place. Any questions? Let's move on. So that's an example of one of the potential vulnerabilities that we can see. Another one is bypassing authorization. We kind of saw this in OWASP, but basically um, uh, if you tie access to user IDs in the interface without actually attaching it more properly in the background to other objects, it might be easy to do things unexpected in an application. You can see this if you take a look at the access control lesson two in OWASP. Another one is escalating your privileges. Um, this is again, a lot of these require um, an understanding of the application, but most users will see some of this going over the years, and a lot of users, as we've seen, can use enumeration tools to figure out what's going on. Um, and it's not just assets, it could also be data as well. So you have to really be careful and ensure that you have proper controls in place. Another one, we kind of referenced this earlier, it's indirect insecure direct ob object references and this allows users to reference things in the file system that they shouldn't have access to by hard coding them or just simply going into the browser and say give me this if you know that there's something in the admin directory and you say give me this thing from the admin directory if you don't have proper controls in place they will be able to hard code a url to get to that content and again as we've seen they can use enumeration tools to find out what that might be Here's another example here. You can, instead of saying invoice, you know, you can get some other user's invoice. And this, this can happen from time to time. You can grab an image, but you can specify a different image value. Any questions? Okay. A lot of the times these are simple get functions. And by changing them to post, you mitigate a lot of those. But as we saw when we did our... Shit. Was it Mr. Robot? It was Mr. Robot. We can do, with Hydra, we can create and draft a simple HTTP post form Hydra attack. And the fact that we have moved our content from get to posts to mitigate against that, I mean, I'm not saying don't do it. There's value in doing it, but it's not perfect. Moving it to post does not completely eliminate the threat. Any questions? Okay. What's next? Now that we've talked about the need of this, let's take a look at implementing an authorization system. As I mentioned earlier, um, what we want to do is we want to create um, authorization for our Stungi blog software. Um, don't worry about that second bullet. I don't think that applies to you. That applies to the web security group. If you want, I can give you access to that where they talk about um, secure websites and secure website writing in PHP. There's a, uh, let me know if you want to access it. I don't know. I'll create a link for it, but I won't make an activity or a competency based on it. But there was a pretty nice um, 
LinkedIn Learn module um, talking about proper PHP development that has value in it. And now that I've talked about this, I'm going to add a link to this module and learn so you can review that if you are interested. It is extra reading and it is not a requirement for this class, but I will add that. Somebody remind me later, please, because I will forget. Perfect. Um, there's a couple of ways that you can handle authorization. Two very popular ones are role-based or attribute-based. We're going to focus on the role-based access control. And as I mentioned just earlier, that OWASP has a real nice set of code that we're going to use to implement our own role-based access control software. It is a very mature project. Um, and we've talked about NIST before. It is level two um, NIST compatible. I don't want to go into it, but it's it's not just a bunch of code a bunch of people threw together. It's a very mature, very popular project. We see it in other projects such as Cake. And it is um, something I want you to add to your toolkit of cool things that you get out of this class. Um, if we're going to do this, there's a couple of different ways of doing this. Now, I talk about the proper way of doing this in this lecture, where you go in, you deploy the software, you ensure that the database config file is set to read-write, so that when you run the startup script, it changes the config and then it populates the database with all the files and everything. Um, for such a good working set of code, the startup, or the install script, I should say, is, is un, unimpressive, to say the least. Okay, So much so that I don't actually use the startup script. If you want to use the startup script, by all means, feel free to do so. Um, you can actually um, go through and run that script. And then once you have it, then you can start creating some permissions to do things on a website. You can start creating some roles that have access to those responsibilities or those permissions. And then once you have that, you need to start assigning users to those roles, okay? Which means that you have to have an understanding of user IDs. There are a lot of tools that facilitate this. And I'm going to give you guys some time to work on this on your own, but I'm going to give you some very specific points to this. There's also a really detailed tutorial if you want to take a look at it online. But this is complicated enough that we're done with PowerPoint, and we're going to take a look at the Word document implementing PHP RBAC that is also in this Learn Show. Okay? As I said, There is a, um, an install script that you can run, but we're not going to, okay? What I would like you to do is, and you know what, I'm going to go through this from scratch. You can close down DVWA. We're done with that. If you download the PHP RBAC file, you see that there's a directory called PHP RBAC version 2 stable. And in that, there's a directory called PHP RBAC. There's also a couple of other artifacts related to um, the Git repository that it's running on. We don't care about those right now. What we care about is the PHP RBAC directory. So once you've downloaded the zip, open it up. There's a directory called PHP RBAC version 2 stable. Open up that directory, and then we want the directory just PHP RBAC. Find a um, directory I don't remember what's in that. Find a directory where you can unarchive that folder too, because as I said, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to upload this using WinSCP, okay? Okay, so there's my PHP RBAC folder. That's what I just downloaded, and this is my um, blog folder, okay? So again, make sure that you upload it to the correct directory. And what we want to do is we want to upload this directory, PHP RBAC, 
to this environment. And you can do it right away, or you can make some of these changes and then upload it. I don't care. At this point, I don't need to tell you your workflow. We need to make some changes to these files. Let's go through that right now. First off, that's the install script. If you want to run the install script, and I don't recommend it, if you want to, you need to go into the database directory and change the permissions of the config file so that the world can write to that file because the install script needs to update the config file. I don't recommend it. What I recommend is that we, first off, we delete these SQL files from the server side, but we'll come back to that. What I recommend is that you hard code the setting here. All right. First off, you need to understand your environment. When I take a look at my blog software and I look at the config, I have the databases on localhost, perfect. The username is blog user, perfect. The password is password. And the database is called, for me, blog. All right. Now you can see that this is initially set up expecting to use SQL Lite, where they have database files rather than a database management system. So we just need to go through and say, no, we're not using SQL Lite. We are using PDO MySQL. Okay. So you can either delete or comment out the MySQL I, the SQL Lite and the SQLite file that it might use, okay? Ensure that the host, well, host shouldn't matter. The user, the password, and the database are configured. The adapter is configured. And then the final thing is this table prefix. And the reason why I'm going on about this is because I'm gonna go into, on my client side, into databases, and I'm gonna open up the MySQL file for today's class. You can see that there is a string here that says prefix, and that is reflected in the config here. Um, no, it's phpr back, sorry. What, what's going on is that we've seen this before, and I'm almost done, guys, we're almost done. Um, open source projects such as Joomla, WordPress, a Drupal, all of these open source projects are very, very popular, and all the code is available for the world to see, which means the database schemas are available for the world to see, which makes SQL injections and other types of attacks on the database that much easier. For a while now, mature database projects have gotten into the habit of having database prefixes. Hiding that prefix so that it's not easy to discover but that's um, what we tend to see um, in open source projects these days is a database prefix, like for example here, PHP RBAC. And then that should be replaced inside of the SQL code. We're going to use the MySQL code here, and we're going to change prefix away from that string into something else. I'm going to use PHP RBAC, but in the real world, I would use random strings, seven or eight characters, just keyboard mashing until I had a few characters, and then that would be my table prefix. I would not use anything associated with anything at all. It would be that random. In this environment, though, that prefix is fine, so highlight the PHP RBAC underscore, copy it, and then go into your MySQL code do a global search and replace and we're going to replace php or sorry prefix and i know that's very difficult for you to see so again zoom in if possible but i'm replacing prefix with some other string again that that is fine i tell it to replace all and it should only replace eight instances of the um code okay create table create table, create table, create table, and inserting four records, okay? It creates a default permission, it creates a default role, 
and then it creates two processing entities uh, permission role and uh, role user but yeah oh yeah that's right yeah it, yeah a permission role and then a role user the third part is the user ID and we're going to do that in a little bit any questions okay so I've changed my database config I've got my database code here with my prefix now I can save this we will see that it has uploaded it to my server I'm going to go back in again because I'm doing this myself I'm going to remove the install PHP file you leave the sources here actually I think you have to leave the sources here you can leave the tests but in the production environment I would probably remove these but let's talk about this there's a directory of tests which gives you a series of sample pages that you can use to add extra functionality what we're doing is just giving us an admin um, level role-based access control implementation there is so much more that this can do and in the tests src folder is a bunch of sample code that you can use okay so take a look at that again on your own database folder I don't need the MySQL or the SQL Lite code so I can delete the two SQL files I do need the database config however okay so we're just cleaning up scripts that we don't want to sit on our server assuming that it's a production environment the auto load we do use and you'll see in the code that that's what you call all the time already any questions okay so I've got my server in place I've got my configuration in place the last piece I want to do is now run the MySQL code select everything and copy it go over to your sqlmanager.net and then what you want to do when you're connected to the correct database is to open up the SQL editor and when you do that you can delete the old code that might be in there and paste the code that you just modified again verifying the PHP RBAC is in place and it matches the prefix matches what you had in your configuration okay or whatever string you decided to use that looks good I can then execute the code it should run without instance and then when you refresh the tables you should see that you have four more tables related to the role-based access control solution any questions on that it came up in my uh, lecture yesterday that well what if I type in something wrong here and I run the script and you know I've got the table name still saying um, prefix here it's not the end of the world to be honest because really once you have this set up properly and run properly once you have this set up properly and run properly and then running with this config here and you rerun the scripts you end up with an extra set of tables which you can simply delete or frankly ignore I would never ignore this in a production environment if you have four other tables that say you know prefix underscore permissions prefix role permissions roles user roles even if I had those wrong table names there alongside of the correct table names it's the end of the world okay they're just extra tables that you won't reference you should clean them up you can select them and drop the table right there and then it'll walk you through a little wizard to do that any questions on that okay so now we have all the pieces in place I haven't even looked at this you can start going through and doing your own instance of an implementation of this okay one of the first things you need to do is in your login script you need to grab a new session variable 
we're going to create a new session variable for user ID. It's going to grab the ID from the database. This code may not match your code perfectly, but it should make sense. Whatever the user ID is in the users table, grab that as a session variable for user ID. Once you have that, you can run this script once, but you must understand your environment. The script that's on page two onto page three. You need to create a new user. So I'm going to create a user called admin. Let's do that together. I am I have my Stungi blog software here. I'm going to register a new user called admin. My admin password is going to be password. You do you. And once it's registered, and I can log in as admin. Perfect. I'm now logged in as admin. And when I check out my days, my members table, refresh, sorry, I have a new user admin with a salted password hash, but the ID is three for me. That's the important thing is that my ID of my admin account, you do you, I don't care what you call the admin account, but the ID is three and that's the important bit. Now that I know the ID that I want to give admin to, you need to modify the code at the bottom of page two to reflect that. So I would change this at the bottom of page two, I would change that from nine to three because that's the ID that I have. Okay. Go through, there's only six pages of code that you really need to play with. And frankly, um, probably a third of that, or maybe let's say a quarter of that is true anyway. So there's not really a lot of um, coding that you need to type in. And frankly, there's a lot of copy and paste. Okay. There's the otter loader. So you're going to have to put that into your application properly. Any questions?